can just base it off the talk I just gave at Stanford, uh, organized by CCARE, which is a center in Stanford. That is a center which is very much devoted to, uh, to uh, spreading awareness and about altruism and compassion. It's uh, quite Buddhist and, and, and uh, meditation uh, influenced, but it's also scientific, and so there's a lot of neurobiology and neuro uh, physiology involved about uh, the importance of compassion and altruism, of course, uh, and how to uh, how to train people to be more altruistic and compassionate. Wouldn't that be great? And what my talk was about: how do we, how would we study altruism and compassion from a uh, uh, evolutionary perspective? And and one thing that that means is that for anything that you might want to study. There's actually not one but four questions that you need to ask. The first question is, why does this thing exist compared to the many other things that could exist? Um, and often based on its contribution to survival and reproduction. And in the case of altruism and, and compassion, that actually turns out to be a very fundamental puzzle. So imagine the altruistic and compassionate individual, okay? Uh, what would be the purest form of altruist and and compassion. How would such an individual behave? Such an individual would be very other-oriented. They would always be doing things for others, even at the expense of themselves. Well, that's a puzzle because evolution is all about f favoring traits that cause individuals to survive and reproduce better than other individuals. It seems that the altruist is at a disadvantage. So altruism, there's something about altruism that's vulnerable to exploitation by that which we call selfish. And so just explaining how altruism can survive in a Darwinian world is a puzzle that was a puzzle to Darwin. And he had a solution, which is actually a very simple solution, is that the altruist can actually uh, uh, thrive in a Darwinian world to the extent that they interact with other altruists. Groups of altruists do well compared to groups of non-altruists, even though the individual altruist might not do well compared to a selfish individual within his own group. And so that's the concept of multi-level selection. Natural selection is operating at more than one level. At the most local scale, altruism is not advantageous. But if we go up in the scale, then groups of altruists are more, are more fit. And so we actually, if we want to know uh, the distribution and abundance of these nice traits in the real world, we have to ask, how often is it the case that this clustering um, takes place. And so there's a whole line of research which has nothing to do to, to, of how do we train individuals to be altruistic. It's what happens to the altruistic individual when they go out in, into the world, do they find each other, and, and so on. And one of the fascinating things about this, which is part of being an evolutionist, is that it, it just widens your frame of, of comparison. So in this talk, which is mostly about humans, I also talked about insects. And there's a, a species of insect called the water strider, which is a, a wonderful insect that skates on the surface of pools and in, uh, in streams. And it turns out that in water striders, uh, there's enormous individual differences among males in their aggressiveness towards females. And some males are sexual predators. They're just hunting for females. And when they find one, they attack them. And they, frankly, they rape them or at least they attempt to. At the opposite end of the continuum, there's males that are gentlemen. They're, they're docile towards female, and they wait to be asked to perform their manly duty. Okay, So why do we get these individual differences in males? My graduate student, former graduate student, Omar Eldekar, did experiments in which he formed groups of males. Each group was a pool, had six males and six females. And these males were, uh, were, uh, were uh, composed to be everything. Some pools had six psychopaths, some pools had six gentlemen, and some pools had mixes of the, of the two. Now we, and then you watch them, and you ask, who gets their girls? Okay? Um, and it turns out that in these pools, whenever there's both types of, of, of um, um, psychopaths and, and gentlemen, it's the aggressive ones that win. It's always the aggressive ones that do better than the non aggressive ones. And so at that scale, there's, there's, everything is favoring the aggressive individuals. So that's part of the story. The other part is that pools with, in which everyone is a gentleman 
the, the females are three times more productive. They have three times more children than the pools in which everyone is a psychopath. Because the psychopaths are terrorizing the females. They can't eat, and therefore they can't lay eggs. And so, and so um, you have this huge difference at the, at the group level. And it's the combination of those two things which keep both types in the, in the uh, population. Okay? Now we go from insects to people. And my work, a lot of my work, is in my city of Binghamton. I study, I study my city the way El Omar Eldekar studies his water striders. And so we measure individual differences among people and how pro-social they are. We might give them a survey, we might measure it in another way, but the fact is, is that there's huge differences among people, men and women, just the way there is in male water striders, in how nice they are. So basically, we measure these individual differences, and then we, we know where they live. So we know that their residential location in the city of Binghamton, plus much else. And when you map the, you create maps of the city, they're called GIS maps for Geographic Information Systems, which look like topographic maps. They have hills and valleys, but those hills and valleys are not geographical hills and valleys. They're hills and valleys of pro-sociality. And it's a very rugged landscape. It looks a little bit like the Himalayas. And what that means is, is that there's neighborhoods in which the average person is much nicer more pro-social than other neighborhoods. And when you look at social networks more generally, which might or might not be spatial, what you find is, is that the clustering that we've been talking about, the fact that, that, that the more the high pros, as we call them, the highly pro-social individuals, that if you're a teenager in the city of Binghamton and if you're highly pro-social, then you have a lot of social support. So there's a strong correlation between your prosociality and the prosociality of those with whom you interact. And it comes from multiple sources. You have a more supportive family, a more supportive neighborhood. You feel that school is more supportive. You're more likely to belong to a religion. You're more likely to engage in extracurricular activities. And so those who give get. And that's the fundamental requirement for, for pro-sociality to, to win at the Darwinian uh, contest. So now, if you're not pro-social, why are you not pro-social? Is it because you were born selfish? Um, or is it because you have lived in such an unsupportive world that the only way for you to survive in that world is to turn off your pro-sociality? One way I, I often put it is, imagine that you're a highly pro-social individual. But Unluckily, unluckily for you, you find yourself in a really mean social environment where nobody's being nice back to uh, you. So what are you going to do? What are your options? Here are your options. There's four. One, you can leave. <laughs> Two, you can try to change those around you and get them to be more pro-social. Three, you can turn off your pro-sociality defensively. Four, you can remain pro-social and suffer the consequences. That's all you can do. And so who would counsel such a person to remain pro-social in that situation? Now, right away, that tells you something a little bit counterintuitive, that if you think that compassion and altruism is such a great thing, and you think we should all be compassionate and altruistic, and let's say that I were able to take you and succeed at that, so I make you more and then, I, and, then, and then you go off and live your life, maybe I didn't do the right thing. It all depends on what kind of environment that you inhabit. And so when we see things we don't like in society or, in, or other people who are, who are behaving in a way which is not uh, pro-social, um, or perhaps they themselves are suffering as, as individuals, often it looks pathological. It looks like something broken that we might want to fix. But what it really is, it's a survival strategy. It's the way they must be in order to survive in the world where they're, where they're at. And that's true not just for pro-social behaviors. It's true for such things as risky adolescent 
behavior, when, ki when teenagers do things that seem self-destructive even for themselves, that actually is often a survival strategy. And if we want to change it, we can't just tell them to stop doing it. We have to actually provide them with another strategy or to alter their social environment so that something else might work. And so this is something which is very intuitive from an evolutionary perspective, but it is not necessarily the way everybody thinks about it. Mm -hmm.